David Miliband, is there a danger that actually what is happening right now is that um, Assad is reading the diplomatic movement as giving him permission effectively, as long as he behaves himself uh, as far as his chemical weapons are concerned, he can use just about anything else he likes. And this is pretty well summed up in what we've seen in Moadamia, where there is first gas, second uh, the water supply being bombed, and, and now starvation. I think there's a real danger arising from the obviously welcome concord to take out the Syrian chemical weapons. There's a real danger that somehow people think that therefore the Syrian crisis is done and dusted as long as the chemical weapons are dealt with. I mean, not only have there been 120,000 people killed by conventional weapons, but this is the gravest refugee crisis probably since the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1970. Nine. One in three, even one in two, up to one in two of the Syrian population um, out of their homes. Five million displaced in their own country, two million destabilizing the neighboring countries. And it's a real danger that there is somehow a feeling that because of the diplomatic breakthrough on the chemical weapons front, the humanitarian catastrophe across the regional level and all the political destabilization that goes with it can somehow go onto the back burner. Well, the organization that you now head up is a clearly a potentially major player in attempting to get assistance, humanitarian assistance, into Syria. But the fact is it doesn't seem the Russians are prepared to use their leverage. It doesn't sound as if anyone's using their leverage to get any kind of a humanitarian corridor opened to alleviate what's happening. Well, there is no doubt that organizations like the IRC that are delivering aid with partners into Syria, speaking for us, about 800,000 Syrians are depending on us for health uh, assistance. That's both in government areas and in rebel-held uh, areas. And there are massive problems. First of all, there's the sheer funding of the humanitarian help, which is way below what is necessary. The UN appeals are about 40% funded. Then there is the targeting, not just of civilians, but of aid workers as well. I've met uh, doctors who say that their colleagues have been targeted at checkpoints. And there is the ongoing violence that is uh, on both sides uh, flouting the most basic norms of humanitarianism and humanitarian help. Well, you see, the British Parliament effectively spoke, it seems, for the West in taking military action off the table, at least any time soon. Um, now, in the vacuum that seems to have flowed from that, the worst seems to be taking place again. So what's to be done? Well, I think that the... Uh, there is a, one thing to be said, which is that all parties in Britain have spoken up for the humanitarian help, and actually Britain is delivering humanitarian help. The West as a whole is not delivering the kind of humanitarian help that's necessary. Let me just give you one uh, part of that that's really very, very simple. There are ten times as many refugees as last winter. But my organization, which delivered about 70,000 winterization kits, that means basic blankets, fleeces, hats, socks, We've got half as many kits to deliver as last year. And that's a sheer funding um, impasse. I don't think it's an exaggeration to talk about a winter from hell that is on the way uh, inside Syria and in the neighbors. If anything, it's worse for the people inside uh, Syria, the five million internally displaced uh, people. We know that we have the capacity to do more if we can get the funding and if we can get the support to reach some of the civilians who are trapped in the fighting. Well, then does the non-existence of a military threat mean that the pressure is off, off the donors and indeed off the regime and the rebels themselves. Does it therefore have in some way to be brought back into the equation? I think that in a way you could argue that the fact that the military options are off the table raises the profile or certainly should raise the profile of the humanitarian help. Humanitarian organizations like mine can't stop the killing but we can staunch the dying. And we can do that through very practical uh, health and other um, help that is desperately needed at the moment. I mean, I don't think it is an exaggeration to talk about people being short of food. There's, uh, people think of the Middle East as being hot, but in, by December, it's gonna get cold to zero or sub-zero temperatures. We've got a matter of weeks to get the funding in to ensure that we can procure the relevant blankets and fleeces and other winter uh, elements to help people simply survive the winter. There are terrible reports of uh, health 
um, catastrophe in Syria, actually reports of typhoid breaking out. Uh, if anything, it's time to, for a humanitarian surge, given that there isn't going to be a military surge. OK, well then, do you have to call upon people that are not perhaps immediate partners to international rescue, like the Russians, for example, to say, use your influence, help us now open corridors that are going to alleviate this appalling impending winter? Definitely. And one, there was one significant uh, further development at the UN last week in the passage of an important so-called presidential statement. It doesn't have the uh, power of a UN uh, Security Council resolution, but a presidential statement nonetheless. It has uh, some force, and that called on all parties and their supporters to protect civilians and to protect aid workers who are trying to get access to do their work. Now, it's incumbent on all sides who are supporting players in this conflict, whether they're supporting the government or supporting the rebels, to hold those people to account for higher standards of humanitarian help. Because, frankly, we're going back to the Dark Ages in the way some of the civilians are being targeted in the Syrian conflict. And if the world can't stand up in the face of that kind of abuse, then I'm afraid it sends a terrible message about what's tolerable. Well, I mean, you mentioned the world, and one of the real problems for the world is that there are terrible threats represented within the rebel side uh, as well as what's happening generally in the humanitarian terms because the jihadi uh, fighters that are now uh, waging war on the rebel side are now said by Human Rights Watch and others to be probably representing some 50 percent of the rebel force. What's going to happen to them when all this is over? What is the blowback for the West? Well, I think that there's been some incredibly brave work done by Human Rights Watch and other NGOs, non-governmental organizations, documenting what's gone on. Look, there's no question there's been a fragmentation of the rebel force over the last two and a half years, and there's been a radicalization of the uh, rebel force. The great danger is that there isn't a Syria for anyone to inherit after they quote-unquote win uh, this war, and that we end up with an extended stalemate in which the country is balkanized, broken up, in which different uh, factions have got sway in different parts of the country. And you're right to say that uh, the, the real, uh, the worst prospect is that the badlands of Syria become a kind of Afghanistan in the middle of the Middle East, a training ground for global jihad. That's a very serious interest-based argument for the kind of inter humanitarian help that I have been talking about from a humanitarian perspective, which is concerned with the needs of the people and isn't... In, isn't uh, putting up front the interests of nations. We're standing up for humanitarian principles and for saving lives. But I would argue that there are interests as well as values that should uh, raise the humanitarian flag in the Syrian conflict as a way of staunching what is a very, very dangerous spiral. However, I mean, without a military intervention option anywhere, even sort of sitting aside the table, it, it, it seems very difficult to see what threat there is to anybody to stop them misbehaving and therefore do you think a military option should still be somewhere in the air? Well, I'm responsible for 14,000 staff around the world who are delivering life-saving help, literally life-saving help in many uh, cases, including in Syria. I can't start advocating military options one way or the other because I, my first responsibility is to the staff who are working for me and to the beneficiaries, the poor beneficiaries who are dependent on our uh, help. But I think I just want to pick up the word threat. I mean, the dissolution of Syria is a threat not just to the region but uh, wider. And it's evident that there needs to be a very, very sustained humanitarian as well as political engagement with that situation. The warning that you delivered at the front of this program that somehow dealing with chemical weapons has pushed Syria off the agenda is a real warning and one that I think people should take seriously. One other thing, uh, David Miliband, you, uh, you um, tweeted the experience of being in America, waking up in San Francisco to hear about what had happened at your uncle's memorial and indeed the verbal assaults on the memory of your father. How's that been for you? Look, it's hateful when you have uh, your father targeted in uh, that way, traduced in that uh, way. Uh, there's no question uh, about that. But I also have a very strong feeling that the good sense of the British people is to sort, sort out that kind of tarring of someone from the truth. 
and frankly, it's uh, I never thought I'd saw see, see so many pictures of my dad in his naval uniform, staring out from TV shows and on uh, from newspapers uh, as well. The important thing for me is that he was uh, an incredibly loving dad who meant a huge amount to me and obviously to Ed and to my mum as well. And I, I hope that the right lessons are learned.